We're back. Or are we? This is a little bit of a weird one because we are technically wrapping up 2022, but it is 2023. But this is nothing new for us. We've done podcasts in this like weird little stretch before. But the way that I kind of classify this, Chris, just so I can let you know, is that I had this as the part two of our two-part wrap-up because we've never done. We've never done a two-parter wrap-up in two separate videos. We had like that weird Wonder Woman 84 soul wrap-up that we did at the end of 2020. But I figured this would be like a good wrap-up. You know, Nathaniel and I did hit Babylon on last week's podcast. And this week, in order to close out 2022 and get us into 2023 i've got chris back hopefully for the foreseeable future in order to cover in what turned out to be one of the strangest sequel situations i think we could have ever run into the sequel to one of our first couple of episodes that we did in our original 16 episode run back in 2019 this is the finale of our fourth season to wrap up 2022 going into 2023 hard to believe that we're going to be in season five that this is the wrap-up for season four before we get into all that and we'll cover that once the credits roll once we actually get into the show chris happy to have you back on man are you ready to do this? Yeah, I just want to say Happy New Year to the Talk and TV community. I-, I missed you guys. I'm glad to be back. Let's talk some. I don't even know what you call it. Let's I don't just even know got, what Dom, let, roll let, the you damn know what? music. Let's talk Dom. some fucking I, I'm, I'm TV. so let's, stoked to be back. Let's do it, let's everyone. Let's do it. Man, it is good to be back. It's good to be back with the original Talk TV duo after what felt like almost an entire year. Like, you came on, like, what? Like, maybe six episodes total, like, this entire year after what? Like, April, March? Like, you were a busy yeah. guy. We've both been busy. A lot of changes. But 2022 turned out to be, like, in a strange way, like, the year that... The, the, the little year that could in a strange way. Like, I want to I break all that down. Like, the, the episode, the title of this episode and the movie that we're talking about is Glass Onion, A Knives Out Mystery, the long-awaited sequel to Knives Out that premiered... Uh, what's called the weekend of Christmas premiered on Christmas uh, two days before Christmas day. Um, but I wanted to, that, that's just the precursor, right? Cause we got Chris back. And so naturally we, we, we got to g- get the audience in and have them figure out like what's going on with Chris's head. So I just wanted to start off and talk with you, Chris, how was your Christmas? How was your new year's? What have you been up to just in your personal life? And then we can punt it some more about like, you know, what 2022 was a year meant to us. Yeah, for sure. Um, this past year, as Dom said, I wasn't on many podcasts after a certain date. First of all, I got hurt pretty bad in a car accident. We recovered. We are back stronger than ever. And then it was graduating college. And they always say that last semester, prepare to not sleep, prepare to barely eat, and prepare to like barely breathe. And that was so true. But now I'm on the other side of it all. I'm a graduated kid and uh, looking for the future. I'm applying the jobs. Very thankful to have had a great college uh, education uh, experience. I feel like I got a lot out of it. Um, and I'm glad that I can finally get back to uh, something else I love, which is like this podcast and talking about movies with you, Dom. And, and I can't wait to, uh, re- uh, you know, catch up with, I'm sure some of the guests we'll have on some of the old friends. Um, other than that, man, you know, just trying to make the most of it while we're still young, just, just have fun create be consistent do things that are meaningful but also things that just make me happy so sometimes the two are the same great i'm on a talking tv podcast is what that means but sometimes there's things that i'll just do that are just hey we're just doing it to keep the ball rolling and we're at that point in life but tonight all we have to do is is have a good time because we're chatting about freaking the most insane nonsensical thing that i've ever watched oh man well well <laughs> and so naturally and so na- but so naturally netflix has to is has to have put it out because every time we talk about something that's completely nonsensical and there's absolutely no explicable reason for why it should be as successful or as good as it is naturally it has to come from netflix because they're the only ones that are capable of doing that at this point you know yeah but you know to, to just to get out of the catch-up section like Man, a lot's changed, but it's good to be back talking about Knives Out because that was like one of the first podcasts we did, Dom. Um, yeah, it there's is. There's an infamous it picture is. on our old Instagram that got hacked by some crypto guys. Um, Still about my heart. About, uh, yeah, I know, about... We have this photo where we got these like big giant tickets to yeah, go see the well, out. the reason why, and the reason why is because when we went to see it, it was an advanced screening. The movie wasn't set to open until the weekend later, and our theater was doing an advanced advanced screening where it opened it the weekend before, where it went up against Frozen. How crazy is it that 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 for Thanksgiving 2019, Frozen 2, the sequel to one of the biggest animated Disney movies at that time, and Knives Out, an original movie 
blows it out of the water. And this is only two years after The Last Jedi. That's how you know The Rise of Skywalker sucked. That movie was so bad, it made everybody almost forget about The Last Jedi. Well, that's a whole other yeah, podcast. Yeah, that's a different I, podcast. I, I would, if, if the audience wants that podcast, it's on our channel somewhere. You have to dig back through video archives, but you can find that podcast, that's for sure. But no, you're right, Dom. This movie, this Knives Out phenomena, if you will, yeah. has really become something that I never thought it would. It's and... so weird because it's like you wouldn't have expected it from you. Well, first of all, we just got to talk about Ryan Johnson because you wouldn't have expected that a dude who has had a really interesting career. He hasn't actually directed that many movies. This movie's only like his sixth movie that he's directed. So, but he's already like had what feels like such a big impact on the pop culture sphere. And, and so it's really confusing because like, so if you break down his filmography, right, you, he has this movie Brick that he does in 2005, gets wide release in 2006. It's a relatively small movie, you know, but it's the people who see it fucking love it. it go, they go ape shit about it. Then he goes the opposite route because instead of doing like a relatively like mid-budget level movie with a lot of stars going right into a massively budget movie, like what was the career trajectory, instead he takes some time off and he does another like weird small movie uh, starring Adrian Brody and Mark Ruffalo, actually, in one of his earlier roles called The Brothers Bloom. Then he really blows up and really starts to take off in 2012 with Looper, which is a time travel movie starring Joseph Gordon-Levitt and Bruce Willis. Movie. That's pretty good. And then things really start going with The Last Shadow. But so he always has seemed to go back to the well of having these like murder mystery slash thing because every one of his movies that he's done outside of The Last Jedi has had this like mystery noir structure that's kind of building itself towards. I feel like Looper kind of also goes a little bit outside the world, but he's always kind of come back towards like this mystery uh, in order to pull pull a phrase that I know you love, the, the mystery box of it. You know, he loves telling mysteries with a large colorful cast of characters. He's essentially, he just wants to be the new Agatha Christie, you know? And now he's finally gotten that chance where Last Jedi gave him enough juice where a studio like Lionsgate was willing to take a risk on an original story from him because they knew that they could bounce it off of his name alone. And it was a massive success. You know, it worked out. Uh, everything that worked out for them worked out for them. You know, there was a big, uh, you know, there was a big splashy November drop. It was a big Thanksgiving movie. A lot of families could go out to see it. It wasn't like a crazy rated R or anything based off IP that anybody had to do any big research on. You know, it was just, again, come see this murder mystery from the director of the last Star Wars movie. And it worked, you know. It worked so well, in fact, that Netflix was willing to drop $400 million on him for the rights to two sequels, which you've talked at nauseum about that. And like just how in the age of <laughs> in, in the age of the pandemic, when everybody was just throwing money, when these streamers were just throwing money at everything like this happened. So like I've talked enough about Ryan Johnson. Talk about your relationship with not <laughs> sorry. Don't be five. Oh, first been dropping these comments and, and these shits are, are, are crazy. Knives out to a way to hate white guys. Part two knives out to the glass feminism. Star Wars, the last feminist, like uh, Derpy, I, I don't know who you are, but this uh, this stuff has been killing me. So th thank you for those comments. And yeah, Chris, I just wanted your take on um what's it called on Knives Out because you, you also you like that movie a lot more than I did when we watched it originally. If if memory serves, I did like it. Yeah, I look back on it and I think it's well, it's just like kind of a movie that is not really made that much anymore. So I think that's why Knives Out. Not that I think it's the best. Um, adaptation of that format but it certainly was refreshing to see something especially at the time if it wasn't Tarantino or like the a Scorsese film it was superheroes like you know that was like in the era of The Last Irishman and Once Upon a Time in Hollywood so we had something a little different but it was by way of some great ones kind of playing to their similar bag which is the greatest I, I, I would listen I'm not complaining about their similar bag. Don't think that's what I'm saying. Right. But it's like those were the only new sort of blockbusters or hits we were getting was the people who were established already. It was it was interesting and refreshing to see not a newcomer director, but a newcomer film, a newcomer franchise, I guess now, be born out of something that right. wasn't a caped crusader. Does that make sense? It absolutely does because it's yeah. ironic that we got the Glass Onion sequel because we got another sequel to a massively budgeted original IP that is not based off any pre-existing IP also 
came out the exact same week in his glass ending. That, of course, being Avatar The Way of Water, which I don't know if you got a chance to see that yet. But I think there's a very interesting conversation to be had about that movie that I want to have with you. I had Eli on for that podcast. We got to do a lot of good stuff. But, like, I think there's an even bigger argument to be had there about how it's ironic that Cameron puts that movie out in the same year that arguably the whole Marvel bubble is finally starting to burst. Finally. And could this be a return like to, it. like... So it, could this be a return to, like, some original big-budget IP? Who knows? But for now, that seems to be the future. Another thing that this movie, that Glass Onion, in order to kind of transition into Glass Onion, had in common with Avatar 2 is that it's a sequel that's arguably better than the original, you know? Because, like, say what you will about the first one, but the first one, I think, still had some cliches and some things that kind of weighed it down and, and made it not as good as it could have been. Now, I'm not talking about Avatar in this case. I'm talking about Knives Out specifically, you know? Avatar, that's a whole different discussion. But... In this case, like, for me at least, I enjoyed my time with the sequel better in both cases. And what I mean by that is that I feel like the first one, I, I feel like the, Ryan Johnson has a bad habit of being, trying to seem way smarter than he actually is. You know, um, what's it called? <laughs> no one loved you, I guess, if you like The Last Jedi, who are you, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's that's too much. Listen, oh Derpy, my God. Derpy's I might not agree with your right previous now. comments, the whole um, feminist stuff, but anyone's allowed here to, uh, as long as they're respectful, that's voice right. of opinion. And, and well, I got to like say, Elon man, Musk's you're Twitter. Everything goes now. You're a funny guy. I, you're a funny guy. Um, I, I think really we'll get into who hurt me once we actually get into the review yeah. of glass onion. So yes. stick around Derby. If you want to know who hurt me. Absolutely. But yeah, so like I was, I think the first one was kind of weighed down by a lot of like very generic cliches. I think Ryan Johnson, as I said, my big problem with him with almost all of his movies is that he always tries to be smarter than the audience, but like in a really annoying and like cliche way. Like I remember all the people that were like all, all the Twitter bombers that were going after last shadow when that came out, like Johnson was just like egging them on and egging them on to the point where it's like almost like making fun of the fan base and, like I get like him like just having his fun with Twitter trolls I get that but like it's it's the inability that most again Hollywood creatives have where they're unable to differentiate between the people who are like trying to give honest criticism versus the people who are just being trolls and that is the thing that I see a lot of Hollywood people have is that they just do not have the ability to differentiate between the two you know Dan Harmon seems to be the Dan Harmon and the Russo brothers seem to be the only people in Hollywood that are able to differentiate between the two and Ryan Johnson is not one of them unfortunately and so the first one, I just felt like it was very, very obvious and on the nose with the statements that it was trying to make. Um, I thought that the twist with the mystery, or rather the twist on the twist, I don't think was that original or invented because it didn't actually add anything to the story. And I also think that the focus on one character, that being the Ana de Armas character, I think kind of took away from the brunt of the ensemble, which is a very, very talented ensemble. And they're reduced to mostly cloying bit parts. I can simply say that, well, this movie, Glass Onion, is still very much, I would say, equally as on the nose about its themes uh, that it's trying to go for, as the first one was, I will say that I don't think they're the focus on the one character, in this case, the Janelle Monet character, is as obvious as it was with the Anna de Armas character, mostly because I think it's built to in a much more interesting way. I actually kind of like the ensemble more this time because there's less of them so that each character can kind of get a little bit more of a focus. You can get more of them. Also, I think that the difference is that the first one kind of devolved into just Anna de Armas and Chris Evans, and then Daniel Craig just kind of run around like an idiot, like trying to catch up with everything. And in this one, it's much more so like about the group, about the ensemble, about how kind of they all factor into what kind of unfolds with this mystery. And also just above all else, I think it's just funnier. I think it's funnier. I think the writing is sharper. I don't know if it's the Netflix budget or the fact that Ryan Johnson learned from the first one, but I just think it's overall, it's a more well-done story. It's a more well-told story. And yeah, I just had way more fun with it this time around. I, I think also it helped that like, instead of paying money to go and see it in the theater, I watched it at home on Netflix with my family on Christmas Day, which greatly decreased the level of tension the, or a level of expectation, I should say, that I had from it. I already didn't have that many expectations going into this one uh, as I did in the first place. And yeah, I was very, very much uh, surprised and very, very much appreciated where this movie went, even if it didn't, in hindsight, do a whole lot different than I thought that it did with the first one. But that's just my take. So I've talked enough. Chris, what are your thoughts on Glass Onion, a Knives Out mystery? I mean, it's well made for what it's going for. I think that there's a level here of... Well, there's a balance that has clearly been struck. Yeah, it's a star-studded cast. That's kind of their bit now, it seems. And we're clearly keeping around... Um, oh, my God. How do I forget who plays the detective? How am I Benoit Block, Daniel Craig. 
they're they're clearly keeping around Detective Blanc. He's the central figure, which is great. I right. actually like Daniel Craig in this role. I think it is very becoming of him. Um, but I, you know, I think that they they jumped off the deep end too quickly. Let's let's go with that. Not okay. in the not in the way that because the central feel that was present in the first one that I loved so much. What I loved about the first one was. I wouldn't say it was an acting masterclass, but it certainly let the actors showcase their abilities. It gave them a lot, in my opinion, to work with. It gave them, it made them, it made their abilities as actors in those roles at the forefront. That's what I liked about it. It, they have to sell the Who Done It. It's 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 really their job. Yeah, the script is there, and it was a pretty well, you know, it's not like different than Clue or like I said, it's not a, the the first Knives Out wasn't groundbreaking. It was just. We hadn't seen this kind of movie in a while. And I think because we hadn't seen this kind of movie in a while and because it was actually a well done version of an old sort of format, it became a hit. It filled a void. It showed people, hey, there is something else Hollywood can offer. How about this? And people said, you know what? How about that? I want to go see that. I like that. I'm going to tell a friend about that. It had a very talented star studded cast who I think made the most of what they were given and brought a lot to the script on top of what they were given. It allowed them to play with each other as actors, not, not green screen. Like most of them are used to not, you know, filming uh, piecemeal like these Marvel films do. Like I felt like they actually made a movie in the old traditional way. And even if they didn't, I felt like that, which was cool. It was nice to feel that way again, I think. So that's what I think the first Knives Out really did. It, it, it tapped into a, a want consumers were feeling. Maybe we're expressing it a little more now, as you hinted at, with Marvel sort of, I think it's safe to say the majority now can see that Phase 4 really has been a downturn. Back then it was a little more hidden. It was a little more covered up. Or, or rather, let's use a different terminology. Maybe if you don't think it was hidden or being suppressed, Maybe it was just starting to emerge, and so it was kind of hard to see it because it wasn't as uncovered as it is now. We hadn't excavated their downfall as much as we have now. And and so Knives Out, the first one, being more grounded, being a more traditional murder mystery, you had your familial drama, you had your big money at play, right? You had these traditional things that, I mean, why do we watch Succession? Well, there's big money at play. There's a familiar drama. These are people that are in positions that are actually pro- practical, whereas I don't think Glass Onion, there's not much here that's practical. Not everyone knows a billionaire to get invited to a private island, whereas in the first one, people know families who have wealth, who have drama. I mean, everyone's obsessed with uh, succession for a reason. and And so I think it it being a little more grounded was why it was such a big hit and which is why we have Glass Onion now, obviously. Glass Onion, like I was saying, um, it's not at fault of the actors. I think that they were... The actors bring as much to this one as I do think they did in the first one. Sure, it's a different cast outside of Daniel Craig, but I like the the chemistry there or rather the... um, adversarial nature between most of these performers i feel it was good casting i feel the characters they fit the environment that they're playing in i don't necessarily my big gripe with this film all of that to say now my biggest gripe with this film is i just think we got so far away from the original formula and i know this is now anthology and that's fine I guess it's not what I expected and it didn't, but it didn't have to be what I expected, but it's just a little too zany. It's a little too out there. This whole Elon Musk billionaire kind of guy inviting someone to a private Island in the pandemic to play a murder mystery game. You have a governor leaving her constituents. You have a failed actress who can't keep her mouth shut and is just has these tendencies that she just is, wow. should be canceled for. It just seems mm. like, the issues the people had in Knives Out, the first film, they felt real. They felt human. Now it's like, we know these people exist, but it's like... Right. Now Netflix is coming to the picture. 
it doesn't have the same level of humanity because when I look at like the celebrity tabloids, I think, well, this these are real people, but this is no one I would ever right. know would be in right. this situation. It, Whereas in the first Knives Out, maybe I might know someone who's fighting for the family fortune. You know right. what I mean? It's it's the Netflix and the artifice of it is what is what I'm getting from what you're saying. Why because do you again, keep pinning Netflix on that? I'm curious. I will I, I will explain why. I will explain why because Netflix again has this fastidious thing that they always do, which is that we again the people who love their shit love their stuff, but nobody can ever look at any of the Netflix stuff that they put out now that people love and say that those remotely resemble human beings. You know, because again, it's content created by algorithm and dictated by people's watching habits, not by actual storytelling. You know, the first Knives Out is made by an actual movie studio that actually Lionsgate, right? That actually makes movies that are made by people for people. You know, Netflix, again, is there a single character in Cobra Kai that acts like a real human being aside from the legacy characters? Is there a single character in that Wednesday Adam show that acts like real human beings? No, there isn't. Because again, Netflix does not make shows about human beings. Netflix is run by AI and makes robot characters that appear like human beings in order to appeal to mass marketability and through a combination of memes, online online trickery, and a bunch of other stuff that is really still confusing to us. This is what they do. And, it's, and it makes me sound like an absolute crackpot lunatic, but this is the only explanation that I can come up with because, again, I get all of this and... I, I guess kind of the reason why I'm able to enjoy most of the stuff that I get from Netflix is because when Netflix works for me, it's because it's parody. But the reason why it works is because it's parody done by people that aren't quite in on the joke, if that makes any sense. Like, I, I feel like I, I finally come to this. I finally figured it out. I'm like, what is it about the Netflix stuff that I like? What is it about it? Almost, and I finally figured it out. I think I figured it out in the course of this conversation. Everything that I like from Netflix is a parody. It's a joke. Again, Cobra Kai is a parody. You know, Netflix all this stuff is the joke. Netflix is the joke. And so, as a result, I'm able to not take anything that I'm watching seriously and have a good time. And what makes it even better is the fact that the Netflix producers, not the creatives involved, but the producers are still taking it so seriously, which is why they don't realize that what they're making is crap. And that's what makes it even funnier for us, the viewing audience, which again, I think going back to Glass Onion and why I like it better than the first one, I think that's where we seem to be on uh, differing pages here and why I like it better than the first one. The first one is taking itself too seriously. And at the end of the day, it's like Ryan Johnson's intent is ultimately to make fun of these types of people. But like you said, you're able to get involved in them. And my problem comes from the fact that it's like, okay, but I don't feel like I really know any of these people. It's just a bunch of celebrities arguing. And then they keep focusing on Adam DeArmas, who just looks dopey the entire time and just finds himself from situation to situation to situation. And it's like they kind of sort of have a thing to tie it all together at the end versus this one. I think this one feels like by nature much more well-constructed. And I think that the fact that because the movie is so blatantly trying to make fun of the types of people that it is portraying here. And I think they've got a really good batch of actors that I think are way more in tune with the types of characters that they're playing. You know, Catherine Hahn as the as as the as the uh as the governor and Leslie Odom Jr. as the scientist and Kate Hudson as the as, as the failed actress and Dave Batista as the as, as the men's rights activist, which is so obviously poking fun at Andrew Tate. Like talk about timely right there. Like all that stuff is just so it's it's one of those, it's so on the it's like it's kind of like don't look up last year where it's so blatantly on the nose that people are either gonna really love it or really hate it and in this case very much like don't look up last year I really really enjoyed it because just kind of knowing that it, I'm able to like put all of like all of like that extra stuff like aside and I'm just able to enjoy the story for what it is and I'm kind of like able to enjoy um I'm kind of able to enjoy. Um, Daniel Craig essentially just giving commentary because I finally realized now because this is two movies in a row now where Daniel Craig's character is not really actually solving a mystery. I mean, like he is, but the mystery that he's solving it kind of already has a piece of it that's already been solved. And he's just kind of like walking the real main character who in the last movie was Anna DeArmas and in this case was Janelle Monet towards the, the truth of the mystery. And he's essentially just like providing commentary on the ridiculousness of the situation that he's in. And I know a lot of people like that when it's like kind of just like real world avatars just inserted into their stories. I don't, it's usually pretty hit or miss for me 
In this case, it really worked because Daniel Craig in this movie, I was so much more entertained by him than I was in the first one where half the time he wasn't even on. There was like a solid chunk of the first movie where Daniel Craig wasn't on screen at all. And this one, he's for the most part, he play, he plays a much bigger and more important part. And so that, that that's kind of my reasoning for why I'm able to enjoy it more. I don't know if, if any of the reasons I just said made sense, but. No, I see it. It seems like you're willing to accept the Netflix effect, whereas yes. I'm not. Yes. Because I think I agree with Eric. Um, I do give the edge to the first. Um, while Craig is fun to watch them both, as Eric says, I just think for me, it's like these whodunit movies are already silly enough within themselves. So I don't think you need a billionaire with a private island with all the money in the world and the pandemic to escape and play a game. You know, I just don't, to me, the sell for the first one was how can we take this jokey clue kind of film, this traditional format, this Agatha Christie style thing. How can we repackage that? And, add like a modern twist, but sell it to a wide audience. And I think this movie in its, in my opinion, want to be accessible is one of the reasons why it was a little not hard to watch. Cause it was still fun. Like, don't think right. I didn't like this movie. I really enjoyed this movie. It was fun. It was cool. It's a good way to start the year. Right. It was just a silly, Hey, it's the holidays. I'm watching this. I just got done with the craziest semester of my life really interesting transitional year let's let's kick back and watch something that was fun but i just if you're trying to build a respectable trilogy and i think you are when you dump 450 million dollars into two movies this just isn't the way to do that that i'm never gonna get over that number that is me neither Ridiculous. So I, I, I just feel like maybe we're too in tune with the press, the movies press and, and all that, right? Maybe it's just we're yeah. too connected as critics. But I just felt this was not what I was advertised right. when they when they greenlit two more. I, think, I don't know. I think it's interesting. Well, I think it's interesting as far as like, because I feel like there haven't been a whole lot of people that have come out on either side of the aisle because I feel like, it, again, it, it another unfortunate side effect of the Netflix effect of the Netflix effect is – they, they really hunger down on the whole here today, gone tomorrow thing. Whereas I feel like the first one had such a lasting impact because it did open in theaters. And it's like, how many things on Netflix do we talk about that had a lasting impact? I can think of five things off the top of my head. Movies, I should specify, not shows. Shows are a different story. But movies. How many Netflix movies off the top of your head can you think of that had a lasting impact? I can think of five and they all opened up in like the same, roughly the same time period, you know? So so that that's the other unfortunate <sighs> side yeah. effect of, of Netflix as well is they are all about quantity over quality um, even though all their stuff looks great because of the but, money that they're able to put but stuff here's, into. So here's my frustration. That's exactly what they're all about. But I thought we were turning a corner here with the amount of money that was put into this Knives Out franchise. I also thought we oh. were turning a corner by the sole principle of picking up the Knives Out franchise because like I've been saying right. ad nauseum now, yes, it's a format we've seen before but there was just some modicum of of class to that first one uh, some modicum of let's try to make a movie like what does a movie feel like not a superhero movie not a blockbuster do people remember what it's like to watch a movie and that's what i thought we were getting two more greenlit of, and it just right. doesn't seem to be well, the case unfortunately it's netflix so no because netflix again unless they are like giving all this money to a creator like a scorsese or like a noah Baumbach or like the infinite number of filmmakers that they've given a ton of money to david fincher in particular i cannot wait for the killer when that comes out unfortunately they have shown that when it comes to their stuff that they produce in-house it's like no that is unfortunately not at all the case there is no class when it comes to this stuff even with the amount of money that they funnel into this thing and the other thing too because this also goes back to ryan johnson as well because you can make an argument that johnson is one of the massive creators that they kind of let do whatever they want, which again, I think is the case here. I don't think Johnson ever had any intention of returning to this for sequels. You know, at least I don't think I, well, I got to do some research on, he but said, I, um, I saw a quote. He said that he was always open to the idea and it all depended on if Craig would come back. Okay. Got it. Now well, Netflix Drew, offered the bag of all Netflix bags. Netflix the bag of said. all bags, as, as they keep saying. I, um, I but, mean, but I want to go back to my original thing I yeah. said there. It seemed like you agreed, but I'd like for you to elaborate on it more like my what I was expecting versus what I got. Do right. you think my were my expectations once we heard we were getting two more knives out? I mean, 
are they so off base that I should be like, do you think I, my confusion right now is warranted or, or what? Well, it's interesting because again, taking your, again, I have to take uh, your whole thing and expectations of what you were expecting from this movie out of it and it's separated from mine because again mine were if, again it seems like the total polar opposite of yours you you really enjoyed the first one i thought the first one was just kind of okay to mid i didn't love it i didn't hate it um you know i didn't even really expect anything going into the sequel i didn't even know that we were getting a sequel that was officially confirmed until the news press release happened you know once the um what's it called <laughs> it's been six years it's only been three um <laughs> but uh up, yeah, so, so i guess just the fact of it like i guess i just wasn't expecting for you to have uh, these the, these many expectations for for this going in, you know, because because again, I knew that you were like excited for it and everything, but like you know, my whole thing, my whole thing with it is like I always take everyone's expectations and excitement with a grain of salt because they're gonna that your expectations are nothing compared to what your final thoughts on the movie are gonna be. You know, you could love it, you could hate it, regardless. So I, as far as like whether as far as like trying to figure out what you didn't like about it. That seems pretty obvious, but as far as like your expectations not being where they should have been, I don't necessarily think that's the right phraseology to use only because there's plenty of times where stuff comes out that you're expecting to be good. And that is it, you know, again, it's understandable. You're not as completely hard hearted and cynical as me, where I just go in expecting that nothing is going to be good and having no expectations for anything. And then when I'm surprised, I'm surprised in such as in the case. So let me ask you this. Like, why did you want to cover this film? I know it just came out and it's popular, but like, I mean, are, do, you you want me to give you, get... do you want me to give you, do you want me to give you the, the, the BS answer? Or do you want me to give you like the honest, the honest answer is because we had a slot to fill for the podcast and we need to talk about stuff. And I wanted to talk about this movie in general. And this was like one of the few big movies that I wanted to hit before the end of the year. But uh, just as far as like whether, what this movie's Oscars chances are going to be, because this, there is another caveat to this as well. in that I'm actually you really, really this interested. movie has Oscar chances. Absolutely. Absolutely. For, for not I for any actors, but for, but for best picture. And the reason why is because Netflix always does this every year once a year they always put a push behind one of their big movies and this is their big movie of that year that the, the do what now as far as whether it's going to get in that'll be a different story because again there's a lot of other industry stuff that's going on behind the scenes of this movie that also greatly affect this but as of right now just with the amount of money that netflix put into it and the fact that there really haven't been that many other big ticket netflix movies that have been released this year i mean everything that's come out from them this year has mostly been either mid to bad you know you had movies like spiderhead and the gray man and movies like that, but like none of those movies are getting nominated for Oscars. You know, you didn't really have any big name oh, acclaimed so by awards nature of the machine, They out. need by to have an Oscar machine, film. Yeah, because Netflix always does this every and, year. Because and so maybe some previous efforts fell short. So this one is the next respectable well, well, man up. In well, other the, words, the problem is that they always have their movies. You know, like Marriage Story, like an Irishman, like a Roma, that always get a ton of Oscar nominations, then get one if not, if no wins. You know, and Netflix, even though they claim to be the counterculture in Hollywood, are still trying to impress the Hollywood bigwigs. And the Oscars have made it clear more than enough times that they do not like Netflix. They do not respect Netflix. They do not like what Netflix has done to the industry. You know, so. I, I, I mean, so there was always in this weird push pull back and forth where they need to nominate the movies for ratings, but they hate Netflix and everything that they stand for. So it's always this weird push pull back and forth that we find themselves in. And Netflix but, always um, has that one big ticket movie that they try to put all their coins behind. And just by process of elimination, there's nothing else that they really have this year. Yeah. Now I see your points about why they need to stay in the Oscar game. It's really yeah. something that. Because I've, I've never understood the Netflix Oscar game. I've never, I've never ever understood it. I only understood it in 2019 when they had two gigantic filmmakers put out movies on Netflix with Irishman and Marriage Story, you know, with Scorsese and Bombac. That was the only time, and then the year before with Quaron with Roma, but even then it was kind of whatever. Like, I have never understood why Netflix has always tried to make this big push into Oscars. I never have. That's always probably just like some industry bigwig stuff that just like, I'm like, yeah, that's, I don't But care. I mean, for this to be an Oscar-considered movie, they're, they're just... They're just making themselves a laughing stock. Oh, own. yeah. But, but how is that any different than what they already were? They already they have been a laughing well, stock. Well, I mean, Roma was a respectable Oscar film. Sure. But again, like Roma could have just as easily been bought by A24 or any one of the other movies, you know? But it the wasn't. Only reason why they, they, but, the, they've, but they've put something respectable up in the past is what I'm trying to say. Sure. But compare that to their overall mission statement and compare that to the vast overall, like one exception – it's funny, I always hear about this thing like, oh, that's the exception, not the rule. Well, unfortunately, I've heard another thing that also goes with that, which is that the exception proves the rule, you know? All these movies that would have come out from them that we love from them, those are exceptions. They're always exceptions. They're never the rule, as we have come to learn. And if anything, they have 
if anything, prove the rule because everything else that we've gotten from them has been complete crap. Okay, yeah, fair point. Now, you don't think this movie is complete crap? You seem I to don't, like, no. Get into no, your I, I, do, I do like it. Yeah, I, I like I said, I very, very much enjoyed this movie. Like I said, the whole, so for starters, the, Johnson has made it clear that he likes doing the twist upon a twist, which is where he starts off and solves the mystery, right, within the first like 20 to 30 minutes and then spends the rest of the movie showing how, oh, that wasn't what actually happened. There's a whole bunch of other backstory and stuff that goes on top of that in order to reveal, oh, there's something else. That also comes into play, you know? I personally enjoyed that much more so this time around than I did in the first one. I think the first one, it was kind of redundant. It didn't really add anything, and it was just kind of dumb because it ended up being the exact same thing that we thought originally. And this time, they didn't do that. They actually proved that, oh, there was a little bit more to that, you know? And I think they added, like, a little bit more of, like, layers of complexity to what otherwise would have been a pretty obvious answer, you know? Number two, I just like the ensemble more. There was less of them, so there was more time that we could spend on and focus and get to know them more. And with him, again, with each one of the characters and one of the actors, the fact that they were such a gross, obvious caricature parody of real-world counterparts it, like I said, it, it, that's usually a make or break for me. And in this case, it worked. You know, everything, specifically just Dave Batista, for such a limited amount of screen time. Also, I love that Ryan Johnson is, again, stoked the fires by saying that Batista was something that I feel like a lot of people have known for quite a while now which is that Batista is the best act wrestler turned actor and that he's the only one of, of the big three wrestlers turned actors, him, The Rock, and John Cena. He is the best actor of the three of them, where he actually okay, delivers his roles with a lot of pathos, with a lot of emotion. You know, you believe that you are watching a character when you watch him, even though it is also Dave Batista. You know, same thing with the rest of the cast. Again, it's a very eclectic, very different batch of actors. You know, Catherine Hahn, Kate Hudson, Leslie Odom Jr., Ed Norton, Jessica Henwick, who has proved to be pretty bad in a lot of things recently. Janelle Monet. You know, it's a very different kind of a cast. It's not the cast that you would expect from the last one, which are, for the most part, all movie stars, you know? So the cast, I think that's exactly what I was trying to get at when I started this thing off, Dom. It wasn't the caliber actor. It was the situation everyone was thrown in around this film that I don't think jived with me as well as I would have liked. Because you're right, I think Batista has done the best job separating himself from his WWE persona. I mean, to be honest with you, I, I had a thought watching this movie. Did he use wrestling as a vehicle to get into Hollywood? Was it Which just like, hey, I have heard, through it? And here's the thing. I have heard that as a rumor. I have heard that as a rumor. And if that is the case, if that is true, that is genius. Right. I mean, because I'm, I'm a big believer so of walkthrough the right. doors that are open and i wonder if he did that and right you know he's so good and everything like all the way back to that first well, Guardians of the galaxy with drax and he's so much better than he it's not just that he's good it would be one thing if he was good but it's that he is so much better than how you would expect and i see him working with these incredible directors and it's like, like he has talked to nausea about it like denny villeneuve has talked as cast him in multiple things he's a very prominent part in the dune movies you know i think being an actor he has a work ethic that is hard to come by. Yes. I mean, sorry, being an athlete, he has a work ethic that is hard to come by. And I will say this much, you know, the reason why I think the acting is still just as top tier as it was in the first film. And I do think the first film, the acting was, it was a showcase for sure of, of all those talented individuals in that first film, because he's given such a character that it's just, it's, it's, it's a human and it's hard to believe it's a human because you hate to believe someone's so heinous and disgusting. But you need to believe that if you're watching in the movie. So his ability to sell that is just, I mean, that's acting. You're the one in acting school. Am I wrong? Yeah. I mean, yeah. and, and everyone around him, though, I mean, he wasn't the only over the top one. Kate no. Hudson, I mean, everyone in this movie is going so over the top and give it 110 percent. And I love that. I love my overacting. I love it. I every this single is, time. isn't this isn't this the best kind of overacting? Because I think this movie boils down to and I still don't like the premise. I still don't like the atmosphere. I still don't like the mood. But I, what I do like is the mastery here in both the directing, the writing, and the acting, because I think you can break the rules once you know them so well that you live, eat, breathe, and sleep them. And I think this is really a definition of shoot your free throws, learn your fundamentals, because one day you'll need to go outside of the box, but you better have that grounding before you do it. So yeah. it's believable. So it's... Yeah. It's I 100% agree. And and like I said, Johnson is a guy who's been breaking the rules since his first movie. Like, break, like I'm telling you, I, I know I've told you this before. You have got, if you want to learn everything that you need to know about Johnson as a filmmaker, you need to watch not just his first movie, but his first two movies. Brick and The Brothers Bloom 
Those movies will both tell you everything that you need to know about Johnson as a filmmaker. Like a brick, the fact that he pulls off an a 1940s neo noir setting in mid 2000s in a mid 2000s LA high school setting is hilarious and shouldn't work, but it does. I'm not gonna watch this at this point. <laughs> it, 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 but it does, and it works so much better than you would think. Also, there's a star. Also, the murder victim in that movie is Claire from Lost. So that that's also another thing that I got to throw in there as well. But um, so here's my issue because everyone's probably confused. How is Chris saying he likes it yet he doesn't like it? I just don't. I just I think I'm having a hard time, guys and Dom, um, separating myself from where we were. Knives Out to Glass Onion. That's a big leap. Yeah. I, I also it's think it's a bit Lots trendy. I think Knives Out. I think the first Knives Out ages like a fine wine. I think that Glass Onion, it's like champagne. If you got to drink it, or or if you you know, there's not there's an expiration date on 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 champagne. There's not on wine. Wine can age and get better over time. Champagne, it, it, once it expires, it's done. And that's where I feel we really lost an opportunity here building this franchise because had it been a little more practical in regards to the real world feel that we got from the first one, man, I think cinema as we know it would be in a better place today um because i do think that first one well it wasn't the most groundbreaking film of all time i I do think it answered a question are there people who still want a more traditional type of movie okay yes there are let's make two more and i just feel like we took a step backwards in what i guess uh you know um philosophically the first one stood for what it did and that's just a little upsetting the the zaniness of it all because i think having a a rich family well everyone knows there are rich people but billionaires i mean those are few and far between and private islands who i will never know someone who owns a private island we'll never know someone who knows someone right the relatability at the risk of uh the relatability at the risk of trying to once again poke fun at present day subject matter again i i feel like again that that that's also what was missing from don't look as much as i enjoyed don't look up last year i think that's also was missing it was missing kind of the human edge as far as like trying to poke fun at all of these characters and factors i know there are a lot of people that like that but like people like us we still we need the human edge we need something to grapple onto to relate to and again netflix is just shown time and time again very much like marvel that they are that is something they are not at all concerned with is the human touch so where do we go from here, Dom, with this Knives Out trilogy? Because I'm um, conflicted. I do well, want to watch well, another one because I want to see, I want to see star-studded cast. I want to see them acting, acting to the top of their ability. I love the interplay. I love the drama. But I mean, should I just brace myself for more craziness? Is, I mean, it, is the first one an, an anomaly? Is that too much to ask for? I Take mean, it away, I Dom. I feel like the biggest thing is that the next one is also coming from Netflix, just like this one. So naturally it'll feel more aesthetically similar to this one at least in a way that it doesn't in the first one i think that's another big thing too is again it's a big aesthetic shit it's a very very big aesthetic shit because everything in netflix has that glossy very clean look to it and the first one didn't have that also the fact that everything with them is wide everything again it, it feels like it was made everything that comes from netflix feels like it was made by a machine and that's the difference, you know? So that's this why... feels very machine-made. Exactly. Like, it feels like minute, AI-generated. The, the minute that they got to the island, I'm like, all of that is CG. And, like, I don't care because I'm having so much fun with the characters, but, like, at the very least in the first one, that's a real set. And, like, there's something that comes from that, you know? And I'm like, I, I've never once under the pretense that anything that I'm watching is not artificial in this movie, you know? And, and, and like I said, but, and again... I can go along with it because that's part of it. The artifice is part of the storytelling. That's, again, the only time the Netflix stuff works for me is when they use the artifice to their advantage, you know? Because everything from them looks way too clean. So as far as going into the third one and, like, what you can expect from it, probably something along the same lines, except it's going to be, like, two or three years later, so it'll probably be trying to capitalize on and make fun of a whole bunch of stuff that'll have happened between now and 2024, whenever this one comes out, you know? Also, I'm going to find it really funny if Netflix keeps putting these movies out right around when the Avatar movies come out, because Avatar 3, whatever the subtitle for that one is going to be, is also set to release in December of 2024. So if this one comes out at that same time, I'm just going to lose it, because I'm like, wow, Netflix, now you're really showing your hand. On top of the fact that this is already, like, the worst year that Netflix and all the streamers have had, because Wall Street completely turned 
on Hollywood after um what's it called after the um a- after the whole streaming wave. You know, the, all of the studio stocks are in the toilet. Warner Brothers' new CEO is just demolishing every uh, demolishing everything previously. You know, Disney uh, is Disney, Disney fired their CEO Chapek in the middle of the night on a Sunday to bring back Bob Iger because that's how badly things were going on. Like, they, they, like that's the thing that we also have to talk about as well, is this not only reflects Netflix, this reflects Hollywood as well. Hollywood is going through a big shift right now, hopefully towards the better, because, I, again, I've been watching a lot of interviews with stuff that, again, b- there are apparently a lot more people in Hollywood that are on our side that are very, very sick of the direction that a lot of content that's come out previously has gone, and they want to make a shift back towards... Uh, you know, not necessarily the way things were, you know, but again, movies like Top Gun, movies like Avatar coming out, being the big, being the big box office draws that they are showing that movies can still succeed at the box office. You know, they just have to be good, which is something that Hollywood seems to have forgotten the last couple of years. Now that the Marvel bubble finally seems to have burst. Now that 2022 was like probably the worst year reviews wise that Marvel has had yet. You know, the fact that DC is finally after years of, pro- of false promises, finally seeming like they're going to shift towards, you know, a more popular direction. You know, Star Wars is officially doubling down. You know, I, I would say that even after a little bit of a rough start, Star Wars had a pretty good second half of the year. And overall, like I said, I wanted to kind of take these last 15 minutes. But real quick, what, what are your final thoughts and, and star rating on Glass Honey? Because I want to take these last 15 minutes to kind of talk about, like, the state of Hollywood and where it's at and what, we're, what we can potentially look forward to going into 2023. You're muted. You're muted, yeah. Sorry, fellas. Rusty. Um, I think, real quick thoughts. It was fun. I enjoyed it. It was nice to watch uh, a movie um, from the comfort of my home. That's always a big bonus. Uh, but I gotta say, it's nothing that I'm gonna rewatch like I did the first one. The acting showcase was there, but that was really about it. It didn't have that same soul, that same... I don't know. That same grassroots feel the first one had i know it was a very hollywood movie the first one had but it harkened back to the days of old and i liked that so it's a three it's not bad it's not great it's yeah. an installment in a franchise that we'll see where it goes yeah for me uh i gave it a four because i very very much enjoyed my time with it but overall yeah I, I agree with a lot of your sentiments like you said it was fun it was a sequel Uh, I liked it more than the first one because of, again, my problems with the story with the first one. But as far as, like again, the cultural impact that this thing is going to have, other than the fact that, okay, it's cool that there's a new original franchise that's not based off of pre-existing IP, something that kind of exists outside of the Marvel DC Star Wars bubble that we've kind of been stuck in these last couple of years. That's the thing that excites me is the fact that, again, between Dune last year, Avatar, now this, there are seeming like there are going to be other franchises, other non-IP based franchise that are original ideas that people can grasp onto. You know, that 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 to me is my big takeaway as far as what I can look forward to going forward, you know, as opposed to um as opposed to just being more of the same. Because again, it's like as much as we can praise the individual stuff that comes from the bubble, we all know it's within the bubble. And I'm so glad that the bubble is bursting, you know, and we're still going to get stuff from Marvel and we're still going to get TV shows from Star Wars and we're hopefully going to get some brand new stuff from DC now that James Gunn is supposedly wiping the slate clean, you know. Um, I'm very, very much so in favor of where of where Hollywood is going, you know. And that's kind of what I wanted to talk about. I know you kind of been... A wall and absent a little bit these last couple of months, but I wanted to get your take on kind of like the last couple of months of Hollywood and where we've been going. Because I think that after probably the worst summer, which is, it sounds crazy considering that we're following up two summers worth of COVID, but after a summer where we got like five movies, it feels like total, and like almost all of them are misses. You know, multi we had Multiverse of Madness, Top Gun, which then just demolished the entire summer, Love and Thunder, Nope, which is now all of a sudden seeing like kind of like a, a, a new career resurgence, Bullet Train at the end of the summer, and like. One or two others that I can never freaking remember, like to going into the one of the best falls that we've had in a while. Like for a while, there was like what felt like two or three months where it just felt like every movie was just delivering in a way that I was not expecting. I feel like it was after Halloween and Black Adam, once Banshees of Inishirin came out, that's when it's like, oh my God, like Hollywood just not let up. Like Banshees of Inishirin, The Menu, Wakanda Forever was actually surprisingly good, Violent Night, The Whale. All these movies that we were just reviewing back to back in a row. And I'm like, where the hell did these come from? And why were we not getting these old the old this year? You know, tar, you know? And what but I'll tell you what, what I've liked about 2022. Was, yes, for the most part, all the big movies were disappointing. I famously have made it a statement that I was not a big as big a fan of Top Gun. Uh, as much as I enjoyed the Batman, 
the, the Batman was still not one of my favorites of the year. We'll see if that ends up making it into the top 10, though. Um, but I, I didn't, as much as I enjoyed the movie, I didn't love it the way that everybody else did. But the thing about 2022 that gave me promise going into 2023 is the fact that this is the first year since 2019, I would say, where we're finally sort of out of the COVID panic. And as far as movies go, it's like people are finally taking some interest in and talking about movies that are not the typical Marvel full because it feels like for the last year, 2021 specifically, all people talked about and watched was Marvel movies. And there were a lot of movies that came out that weren't Marvel movies, but if it wasn't a Marvel movie or an HBO Max direct day and date drop, no one was talking about it. And that's always the stuff that kills me because I'm always in it for the smaller movies that people can find out about and talk about, you know, because unfortunately, again, we also have to live in the world of media which is unfortunately a rough one. And unfortunately, in the world of media, we have to acknowledge that people have to watch them and people have to be engaging in conversation about them for them to be considered successful. You know, it, it doesn't no good if nobody's talking about them, unfortunately, you know, if I'm the one person that's advocating for them. And so naturally, it made me ecstatic that people are going nuts about movies like Everything Ever All at Once, like Banshees of Inisherin, like The Menu, like Tar, even Avatar, which is like one of the biggest movies of the year. The fact that people are going nuts over that and all the bullshit, stupid criticisms of, oh, it being a white savior movie and all that nonsense that the last 13 years have been saying uh, about movies. You know, it made me ecstatic that pe that as many people were still excited and wanted to go and see that. You know, it made me thrilled. I have never more been more excited for the future of movies than I am now, you know? So so I, I just wanted to get your take on that, you know? Still muted. You're right. It's it's a good time. I feel like we are like it's like you said earlier, you know, there's like a lot more Hollywood insiders than we might think that feel the same way that we do. And hopefully this is insinuatory of a changing of the guard. And if insinuatory is a word, then I'm right on the money with what I just said, because I think it's all valid and holds water. It's it's really kind of like a very liquid time. Where will we flow? How will the tides ch yes. shift and move? Yes. You know, as far as missing a decent portion of this year. I don't feel like I miss much. You've given me the spark notes of what to catch up on. Um, I'm working my way through it. Not much of it has been absolutely great. Um, some of it has. I look forward to a brighter future, though. I feel like that's something that's been on the horizon for a while. I think we need it to sort of get hit with the, for lack of a better word, like with some of like the 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 smog and the, and and you know the sludge for a little while. We had to sift through it because we realized oh okay she hulk mm, yeah i'm not really that excited about this disney plus tv show why is that maybe because the last few were formulaic and not great maybe because the last 10 years of my life were formulaic and not that great i don't know but all i know is that since endgame i'm starting to notice the formula because it's not working at least the formula worked before so i was comfortably numb now i'm not so comfortably numb i find myself complaining when i talk about marvel more whereas before it used to be invite everyone over to watch all of the films in chronology before the next one comes out now it's like i guess i'll go it's friday night right it gives me something to do i feel like you're hearing more of that outside of this this Yes. In the real world. Yes, absolutely. So, and people are starting to get sick of it and they're showing it with their dollars because again, I, again, I hate to say it because it's like, it wasn't the only movie that made money this year, but the fact that Top Gun is the biggest movie seemingly in our lifetime, apparently, which I, I still don't know how that's possible, but, uh, cause again, I have my own gripes with Top well, Gun. your still, lifetime. I'm uh, a Titanic uh, kid. Yeah. Well, I was born that year. What are you talking about? Um, <laughs> what's it called? <laughs> And and Endgame topped Titanic and Avatar. So I know I was kidding. I didn't know why know, you said that. I know, that. I know, I know. But yeah, yeah. So th th that's kind of where I'm at. You know, again, a couple years of crap, a couple years of COVID fueled stuff, a lot of years on TV. But I can say this though, 2022 year, crappy of a year for movies as it was. Man, this might be the best fucking year for TV ever. And I cannot wait for you guys to catch up on that for our top 10 list that we're coming out with that at the end of January. Podcast. That's a different <laughs> podcast for a different day, but we will be coming back. Like I said, January tradition is what always goes. You got a couple of sparse topics. Eli and I, I think are going to be going live like at some point next week for just like a bonus one to talk about that Netflix show Kaleidoscope, but just because that's another like interesting experiment that Netflix is doing. And I'm always in favor of when they do that. But we'll, we will be returning in two weeks in order to officially kick off season five with last of us. We'll be going live uh, as soon as that, um, as soon as that premieres. As soon as that premiere goes um, goes up on January 15th, that'll probably be a later one because that's going to be a long premiere. But we'll be going live as soon as that one's done. And then we'll be ending January, same as we always do with our top 10 favorite TV shows and movies. I know I don't understand why all these critics are always in a rush to get their list out by the end of December instead of waiting to the end of January. But I, 
I'm just realizing now that that makes sense because they get to see a whole bunch of movies in advance because they get like, you know, critic screeners passes and all the other things that they get for being good little shills and propping up a bunch of crap as opposed to us Onyx hardworking critics, hardworking, working class critics who operate outside the system. But yeah, that is what we have planned for January. And we have a whole bunch of more fun stuff planned for you guys for the coming months in February and beyond. This is the end of season four. Onward to season five, Chris. One more year, and then we'll officially be at the halfway point of our 12 seasons of this short film. It's kind of crazy that we made it this far, but I'm excited. I'm, I'm very, very excited to see what is on the horizon. So we're going to good people follow you on the interwebs. We're back. It's it's official. Talking TV season five is about to begin. I look forward to exploring this realm further this year with you guys and our audience, Tom. It's going to be a great time. Thank you, Eric. Thank you, Luke, and everyone else for joining as usual. Um, yeah, you can find me at Christian Ivanko anywhere that matters. I've actually been posting um, a video to YouTube every day that's been going really well on my personal YouTube, which is at Christian Ivanko. It's a music channel. So if you're interested in some songs, I do covers of classic songs that I love, modern pop songs and my own original music check it out as well as check out our shorts feed we post a video every day here of course i don't know if you guys knew that or not i don't know how shorts quite pop up for you guys but yeah check out my personal at christian Ivanko. of course thank you guys for continuing to support us and please follow my good co-host and partner in crime dom dom take it away man where can of they course, find you? people at movie nerd reviews across all platforms follow the official talking tv podcast across all platforms i'm the most active on our tiktok and our youtube shorts i'm trying to get our instagram back in ship shape it's been a little bit of a rough last couple months that i've been in school but i'm doing my best in order to try and make sure that we actually have a working uh page of some kind before we get into the new year so be sure to follow us on all of that subscribe to us if you're new here on youtube and twitch which we're streaming on simultaneously this episode will be available on spotify and apple Podcasts to listen to tomorrow like i said where you can listen to all of our previous episodes that we've released going all the way back to stranger things season three our first ever talking tv episode at one point chris i am considering taking the six episodes that we did for the movie nerd podcast uh way back when between like 2016 through to 2017 and publishing them at some point as like unofficial official bonus episodes. I am considering that at some point, just because that would be absolutely hilarious to see us just completely unfiltered from a completely I, different time period. That would be, that would be something else, you know, some completely outdated episodes for sure. But like, just, just to see it, you know, cause I still have them. I haven't gotten rid of them. I'm going to have to listen to those. Let me listen to those and we'll talk about it. And the they're closed still, door they're, still, they're still on my old channel. They're still on my old channel. Movie nerd reviews. Okay. I have not taken it down. It is still a thing that is out there. But like I said, that's where you guys can follow all of us and all the stuff that we've going on. It's been a, all that being said, it's been a great 2022, but I'm glad that it's over and I'm ready to move on to bigger and better things in 2023. And as always, people, you know, I've got the same sign off as I always do. 12 seasons in a short film and watch more fucking movies. We'll see you guys in 2023. Peace out. Is Dom going to do it?